Right, let's look at the Mazala and how it can affect your play and how to build a tactic using it. So what is a Mazala? It's kind of a central midfield position that drifts out wide and tries to jump in pockets in between your winger and your central areas. So he's going to be somewhere around here when you're attacking, kind of drifting in there. Instead of going all the way over here, he'll kind of drift out here, try to influence games from this pocket. So using this sort of setup here, you'll get Walker coming down the right with Foden coming inside and you'll find Silver there's a Mazzala dropping in. So for overloads on the right hand side, it's a good little setup. You might want to be a little bit wary of the fact that they might get in each other's way, but when Mazzala comes out, Phil Foden should come inside. Let's take a look at that in match. Let's highlight the players. So there's Walker. There's Foden. There's Bernardo Silva, nice and advanced as the ball comes down the right hand side. There you can see we've got a bit of an overload now. We've got Walker, Foden and Bernardo Silva all grouped together. Foden is on his way inside. As he does, Bernardo replaces him on the right backing up Walker. So Foden turns into the first striker. There's Silva backing up Walker in that Mazzala role. So that's one way you can use a Mazzala to provide overloads down one side. But if you want him to be more aggressive and take more of a hands-on role, maybe you're going to play without a wide man. So Foden can jump across there, then you'll ask the Mazala to jump into an attack role. And he will be the main focus with the wing back as well. So he'll spend more time in here being more aggressive with less eyes on defensive work. Now the change you can see is Walker and Bernardo Silva, the two down the right hand side. Foden's found himself in the middle, so we've got a three in the middle. Bernardo's right in that pocket now, acting more like a winger when he's on attack. And the fact there's only two of them down that side means there's more room for him. He holds his position when they win the ball back. You can see how wide he is and Walker's just outside of him. There we go. The combination with them two again. And with Foden moving across, it means there's more threat in the middle. So the Mazzala on attack and the wing back are doing the work down the side. With more men in the box, there's three or four now in the box. Just means you're going to have a few more options if you want to get more bodies in the box and less out wide. So that's a couple of ways you can use the roll, where you can use it to back up an overload side, or you can use it more as one of the main threats down that side. It's a great option if you don't have an out-and-out -out winger down that side, you can use one of these players instead to combine with a fullback. The player instruction wise, they come hard-coded with get further forward, stay wide and move into channels and roam. So obviously they're going to roam away from there, getting further forward, staying wider. That is the remit of the Mazala. There are things you can add to make him more aggressive if you've got a particular good cross of the ball, such as De Bruyne, you could easily ask the cross more often, and you've got everything. It's pretty much a blank canvas. If he's a great dribbler, Bernardo Silva, dribble more, shoot more, that'll be up to you. Play dependent and take more risks again. If they're a great passer with good vision and technique, you can add that in as well. For example, those player instructions we've added to Bernardo Silva would be ideal if you look a bit further down. Take more risks, he's got passing 17, vision 17, cross more often, he's crossing his 15, and his dribble more is 17. So you can really make your Mazala superfied, if you like, with extra player instructions, making it more important to your team. The 4 3 3 is a great formation to use the Mazala in because you've got that extra cover from a defensive midfielder, so you can use him to overload, like we showed you. Alternative 4 3 3 where he has more of a responsibility to provide width alongside the wing back. It can work in other formations, but I'd be a bit wary about 4 2 3 ones because remember, he's going to spend a lot of the time in there, which means your central midfielder alongside him will have a lot of ground to cover. But you can use him in a 2 in central midfield if there's significant cover behind him, such as 3 at the back systems. But all in all, a great flexible role that allows you to do different things with your formation. Playmaker time. Okay, deep lying playmaker. The game lets you know what's cooking. He's going to sit in between defence and midfield, initiating attacking moves with pinpoint passes. There's the key phrase, pinpoint passes. Now I've set him up alongside the other two central midfielders. You can, of course, drop him further back if that's the way you want to set up. But for the sake of this video, he's going to be set there and it's going to be Luka Modric. Coverage on the pitch, he's going to be in this sort of square here. That's where he's going to operate, both in defence and attack. Now this is why it's a nice role as well, because it means you don't have to necessarily use a defensive midfielder because he will naturally drop a bit further back. Further than your other two midfielders, you can see we've got two midfielders here, A and B, and he's sat in between them. As the opposition get the ball, he drops further back. And now, as I zoom out a little bit, he's just in front of your back four as the shield. So you don't necessarily have to use a destroyer type midfielder if you don't want to. So your DLP, your deep line playmaker, will always be the one who drops to show for the ball. Just like there, he showed for Nacho, but he didn't quite get it. Now Rudiger's going to see him. You can see how far ahead the other two midfielders are, and he's dropped into that gap. 
Rudiger will find him now. Now, when he receives it, if he's an anchor man or a defensive midfielder, less expressive type of player, he'll probably play a safer ball. But remember what the description said, pinpoint, passes, initiating attacks, and that's exactly what he does. Time and time again, you'll see him pick the ball up in these sort of positions, immediately spin and play a forward thinking pass. The role is a ball magnet, all your team going to look for that player, which is why most of the time he'll have the most passes, his percentage will be really high, and you will have a few key passes involved in it from deep. But yeah, when using it, keep an eye on him and watch the amount of forward thinking passes that he plays. Like I said, the heartbeat of the team, if you look up here at progressive passes, you can see far and away, he leads that with 13. So 90% of his movements will be in that sort of area that we showed you. There's his average position for the match, with the ball and without the ball, all in that sort of area. Advanced playmaker, now he's different from the deep line playmaker because he's going to do exactly what he says on the tin, he's going to be more advanced. The game will tell you he operates between central midfield and attack. He can play out wide but we're going to focus on him being central today. His key areas are going to be in and around here, this sort of zone here. It gets higher up than the deep line playmaker does and attempts more killer passes if you like rather than the progressive ones the deep line playmaker will make. So when defending, you can see he doesn't drop back anywhere near as much as deep line playmaker. Pause it there. He stays pretty much in line with his other central midfield partners rather than shielding the back four. So something to bear in mind if you're going to play this role, you might want a more defensive minded midfielder in there with him. Now when we're attacking, you can see him at the top of the screen there and then look where he bursts to. Right into that pocket in behind the strikers. When he's a deep line playmaker, he's back here asking for the ball. Pretty much like Valverde is. But the difference in the roles is huge because he's now wanting the ball in that area there so he can pick out key passes. Now obviously being higher up means he's going to get more involved in attacking movements. Look, right in that pocket there and he's got options where he wants to pass it. Lovely killer ball through to Vinicius. Now he's hanging around on the edge of the box. You won't see the deep line playmaker there much occasionally but not as much as this. But don't think he doesn't track back, and tracking back does sometimes help to some key movements. So you can see there where he is. He's quite high up, but he's still dropped back like the other midfielders. And he's in a position to receive from the centre-back and ping those passes in, which can lead to some swift, swift counter-attacks. All the while backing up the attack. But being more advanced means he gets involved quite a lot in the attacking third, giving you options, and when killer balls can be more frequent. You will find he won't be the heartbeat of the team like the deep-line playmaker is, with the passes more evenly spread out. But if you're looking for a player role to unlock some defences a bit further up, that could be the one. Remember all those movements and passes you just saw were all from that central midfield role as an advanced playmaker, not in the pocket. So you'll get less of the progressive passes. You can see six there, just six. But when you're looking for key passes and clear cut chances created, Advanced Playmaker is probably the way to go that little bit further up. His average position is an Advanced Playmaker, so there's his overall average position, so well over the halfway line. With the ball even further forward, and even without the ball, he's still well over that halfway line. So two Playmaker roles, but pretty different ones. Think of the Deep Line Playmaker as the one that initiates attacks from deep, getting movements going, and the Advanced Playmaker will look to create chances higher up with through balls and killer balls. Admit it, this is a role you don't really use, right? Today we're going to look at the wide target forward. Right, your wide target forward, he will be the main outlet for clearances and long balls from the back, so we can use that to plan our team instructions later on. You want to put him against a smaller fullback, and most of the time that will be the case. So you can get him in support or attack, and I'll tell you this, the only difference is very minimal. If I look at the wide target forward on support, his hard-coded player instructions are hold up ball, dribble less, hold position. He adopts that start position. If we flip him to attack, he moves ever so slightly forward and the hold position is replaced with get further forward. It's as simple as that. The in-game description will basically tell you that as well. Support duty, offering knockdowns and opportunities to onrushing players, attack, pretty much the same thing, just weirdly worded differently. Asked to receive the ball in attacking areas, make their presence felt to bring teammates into play. So basically what the support duty does the only big difference is, with support duty, he's going to hold his position there, but when you flip him to attack, he has a little bit more of a license to get forward and potentially roam around a little bit more. So to maximise him, the roles around him are absolutely vital. 
To show you what I'm talking about, we're going to use Marcus Taram, who's six foot four and very well capable of playing that role. Now, having a player of that size a little bit wider means distribution from the keeper can be mixed up. If we aim for him like this, you can see, look at the size difference there between the fullback and our wide target forward. He wins the header, lays it down, starts the move off. And that entire goal came from this first instant there where Sommer looks up and sees Taram there and picks him out up against that smaller fullback. So I said the roles around him were important and here they are. You need players that are going to move in and around him for when he's holding that position out there. So I've got a Volante to run into that gap for a potential knockdown. A wing back to either overlap him or underlap him on that side. If you have a little look at the team instructions, I've gone for some very basic ones. Focus and play down the left. Encouraging an underlap, you don't have to use that because he will look for that naturally. But it's one that you could maybe add. And in transition, I've got the take long kicks to encourage it. And then I've picked him out via position. So you, to do that, you just drop this tab down, pick out the position, that way the keeper will pick him out. This can obviously be tweaked, but it's all about movement, that's the key thing. So for this next match, we'll drop the forward to Shadow Striker, so he's right near him. We'll have another striker in there like that. So now we're going to have three options in and around the wide target forward, because we've established that he's getting loads of the ball. So we're going to have a wing back, a volante and a shadow striker all around him. And added bonus, by the way, is it's a lot more defensive aware, this role. We see him up there. As soon as we lose the ball, he runs back and he tracks the fullback. So inside forwards and trequatistas, roles like that, won't be as good in defence as he is. You can see he's not even leaving his man. Proper, proper good defensively, this. So if you've got a really good crosser of the ball on one side, maybe as a wing back, you can add cross the far post into that because that's going to take advantage of his aerial ability at that back post. It's this scenario where I love this role, when you've got a good cross on the ball on the other side, setting him to cross to far post. We can see Taram down here, look at all the room he's got, and when he does get marked, it's going to be by a full back. Dumfries gets it, here he comes, and that back post is all his. That was pretty much the perfect example of that, and you can see Kufal, who's marking him at right back, only five foot nine. So now we've done three set on that far post crossing. Taram's going to be on Kufal all the time, time after time. Watching the match, it became clear how important the role was to this team in this setup. Getting picked out from all angles. Starting moves off. And you can see that in the match stats. Up against a smaller fullback, 19 aerial duels he went for, and he won 78% of them, showing that he's got the dominance there and his team are looking for him all the time. Ball magnet high up the pitch. So it's a really interesting role. You just need to make sure that you get players around him. If you don't have players around him and he gets a bit marooned out there, he's going to have nobody to pick out. You might not get the best out of him. If you're going to play it, play to the strengths. I've got focus play down the left. I've asked my fullback to cross that far post like we've seen. Work the treat. Something to explore, and if you've got any good tactics that come of it, let me know. Okay, the two fullback roles today we're going to look at are inverted wingback and the new one, the inverted fullback. Starting off with the inverted wingback and importantly on defend duty, okay? As the description will tell you, with a defend duty, the wingback will hold his position and sit a bit deeper. So when you have sustained possession, he will jump into this sort of area here. And in this system here, it'll sit alongside Barella. That's because the Mazala will vacate the area and he will come across. Now, if these two midfielders were both in this zone here, he wouldn't come across unless one of them vacated the area, perhaps being a Secunde Volante leaving the area, then he might come across. But because they're both in that area, he'll stay a little bit further wide. But we're going to look at him when these two midfielders are in this role and we'll see how much he comes across and pairs up with Barella. Okay, we've just won the ball back. Dumfries is down here, the inverted wing back, and there's Barella. So keep an eye on these two because he's going to match up with him in this new role when we start getting a little bit further forward. We're going forward now, and if you pause it there, you can see Dumfries making that break into this area here, and there's Barella. They're going to form a double pivot. Now, because he's on defense duty, he's going to hold his position somewhere around there. You can see he's just holding back, holding back. If I pause it there, you can see in line with Barella. There's your two central midfielders, and it allows the other midfielders to bomb on a little bit more. The complete opposite can be said of the traditional wing-back on the other side, DeMarco, who's way down the left-hand side, really tight to the touchline. So you can see the difference between those two roles. Now, when you flip the inverted wing-back to attack, you can see more expressive player instructions, such as dribble more, taking more risks, get further forward, and roam in front position. So what you'll see from the inverted wing-back on attack is he'll start in his right-back position, 
move into the DM spot, but it'll be more expressive, it'll dribble more, and it'll get way further forward. It's going to turn into a really good attacking weapon. It's similar to how Tottenham use their inverted wing backs. You can see there's alongside Barrera at the minute, but as soon as we start going forward now, he starts breaking forward as well. He's now on the edge of the box, and then when Taram gets the ball, he's there for the pullback in the box. Big difference from the defend. You're effectively adding in a new attacking position, despite him starting at fullback. You can see here where he's lurking on the outside of the box, but when he sees the opportunity, he's going to break into the box. Bang. If I take that back, you can see he's forming the double pivot with Barella, but because he's going to attack duty now, he leaves Barella to it. He sees his opportunity and he storms into the box. There you go. Look at the difference. So a really potent weapon. Now on the flip side, if you flip him to inverted fullback on defence, you're not going to see any of that. He's not even going to get as high up as into that slot there. He's going to be very much tucking in from the fullback position, becoming an extra central defender. Now this sums it up perfectly. You can see the difference here. Don't forget some Barella. We're used to them forming that double pivot when he's a wing back. However, when the ball comes back to the centre back, you can see Barella ghosts on. Dumfries holds his position and he's still pretty wide. There's a centre back there. As the ball goes further upfield, instead of joining the attack, he sits way back there and forms a back two with the other centre back. You can see how far ahead of him Barella is. If he was an inverted wing back on defence or attack, he'd be in and around this area here. So as an inverted full back, it's more assurance, it's more defensively sound. If you're looking to remain solid with extra defensive cover through the middle, inverted fullbacks, the one. If you're wanting to jump into defensive midfield, inverted wingback on defend is the one you're after. And if you're looking for a threat from deep, switch him to attack, watch him dribble, get further up, cause a bit more havoc up there. Three different roles, three different assets. A role that rarely gets used and probably should be used a lot more, it's the anchor man. The anchor man is probably one of the most underused roles in the game. It's one I absolutely love. Referred to as the water carrier, that's an Eric Cantona thing for those of a certain age. He sits in the hole between defence and midfield, intercepting moves rather than seeking the ball out to make tackles. That's probably the most key point here. So what they're saying is he won't actively seek out the ball and run around everywhere. He'll kind of maintain his position here and intercept moves, holding his position. And for that reason, you won't find him high up the pitch either. Now, for this reason, unless you're playing really defensively, the guy next to him, you probably want him moving a little further forward because otherwise you're both going to be stuck there and there's going to be a big gap in between your midfield and your more attacking options. So a good one to use possibly would be a Segunda Volante, so he'll get a bit further forward, or even one of the playmaker roles like Roman Playmaker or Regista. That way, you're going to be safe in the knowledge that he's going to kind of hold this position in there and this guy can just go that little bit further forward supporting the attacks into match we go now in the anchor position for this game i'm playing benjamin pavard now he's a center back who can also play defensive midfield and that's probably an ideal kind of player that you want we're going to watch his movement in an attacking sense here what you'll find for me anchorman is when he gets the ball like that it's a pretty simple ball he'll take on he won't do the risky pass now next to him is hakan who's the defensive midfielder and you can see how much more advanced he is he's playing as a segunda volante pavard's playing as an anchorman but just watch his period of play. Every time he gets the ball, he's there to offer an easy pass. Off the centre-backs or the full-backs is Bastoni. You can see Pavard just there. Takes it. And now you think, could that be a risky pass down the line or a through ball potentially to one of those four up front? And this is what you're going to have to bear in mind. If you use an command, he's going to play a safe, to safe a ball like that retaining possession just doing little simple six yard five yard passes allowing everyone else to do the attacking work you can see up there we've got six players and then you've got your two center backs and your shield in front of them which is the anchor man he just sits back and lets everyone else get on with it so the anchor man plays a safety first style and you'll notice that in the pass completion percentages very very high all the time because he doesn't go for the risky passes so what about defensively he's more likely to wait for the opposition to come to him so they come into his zone and then he will try and intercept such as there where he goes for the header doesn't win it and then bonaventura is going to come in his zone and he takes it off him so he doesn't go seeking the ball but if they come in his zone they'll go for it this halftime heat map will show you where he kind of sits you can see he's a lot deeper than his defensive midfield partner sitting in front of the back two so in attack or defense situations, he's going to be confined to this sort of area here. He's not going to stray too far away from it looking for the ball. It's a good safe option. You can see that here after about 90 minutes of this match now. He's 59 passes at 96%. So not the most aggressive role, both in defending and attacking actually. But if you're looking to lock a game down, perhaps building a possession-based formation, 
that could be the role for you. That's emphasized when you look at the key attributes for the anchor man. We've selected it there and you can see things like passing, technique and vision, not necessarily required. Same with work rate because he's not going to cover a lot of ground. He's going to stay in that sort of area. So concentration, decisions and positioning are higher up in the skill than more creative and more stamina based attributes. If you don't feel like building a tactic around that, totally understandable, but I would consider bringing it in when you're trying to seal a game. A prime attacking role in Football Manager 2024 is the central midfielder on attack. Think of the central midfielder role as a blank slate. You can doctor it and change it with player instructions as you want. In the game, it tells you this link between defense and attack. So it's pretty much going to be all over the place. However, with an attack duty, the central midfielder will surge more often into the final third. They're basically telling you that when you get the ball high up, expect to see your central midfielder in and around here or even in the box. So like I said, it's pretty much a clean slate. You can see the only hard-coded player instruction for your central midfielder on attack duty is obviously get further forward. You can then change it to suit the player. So that means pretty much anything goes when it comes to player instructions. The only thing you can't do is tell him to hold his position because that wouldn't really make sense. Everything else is fair game. If you've got a good dribbler, you can encourage that. Same with long shots. A really creative player, you can ask him to take more risks, get a bit more direct. The world is your oyster when it comes to player instructions for this role. It's when you win the ball back you see what he really likes to do. He gets the ball here and gives it. Now watch him, he sets off and he's on his way to join your striker as high up the pitch as he can get. Now joining Haaland in the box. Here again when we win the ball back you can see now that he's basically up front with Haaland forming a front two. So it's a nice option to have if you're playing one up front. It's also a slightly safer option if you like to play a number 10 in there. So maybe you start with a number 10 and an attacking midfielder or a shadow striker and then you can drop him back there because his start possession will always be that little bit deeper and be trying to be a bit more solid. Another added benefit, if you're playing the lone striker and it's one of the striker roles that mean they get a bit more expressive movement-wise and leave the striker position, you can see Haaland here has ended up on the right-hand side. You've got a central midfielder on attack alongside the inside forwards who are filling the void left by the striker. Different type of player in there now, Bernardo Silva. And you can see the intention straight away. He's deep to get the ball from his normal central midfield position. When he gives it up, off he goes to join Haaland up front, making more of a front two. It means in this formation here, we can defend in a 4-3-3, but attack in a 4-2-4. So if you already play a 4-2-3-1 and you're looking to lock the game down a little bit and go a little bit less aggressive, it's a great option to drop him back into there. Or even in a 4-3-3, if you want extra threat from deep, flip the player to a central midfielder on attack, get yourself a second forward in attacking areas. So when you're looking for key attributes for your central midfielder, you still want an all-round midfielder because he's going to be doing a little bit of everything, but the key focus on the more attacking side of his game. Without doubt, passing, vision, long shots would really come in handy. But have a little look for acceleration as well because you want it to break into that area, into the box to back up your striker. It's actually pretty similar to the attacking midfield role. You can see there are very minimal differences in key attributes. A little bit less stamina needed when you're in the attacking midfield zone because he won't track back as much, which is why the central midfielder on attack is more of a different option with a slightly less attacking outlook. So a nice attacking midfielder option coming from a bit deeper than a normal number 10, giving you a little bit more security, but we're still with that attacking threat. The false nine role, one of the most fashionable roles in recent times in real world football. So in game, it tells you that the false nine is basically like a really advanced playmaker stroke attacking midfielder, meaning that he starts there, but he's going to spend a lot of the time in this pocket coming backwards, hopefully dragging the opposition centre backs to follow you, making space for the rest of your team to exploit. For this reason, it's important that you have roles around the false nine that can take advantage of his movement in dropping into gaps. When he drops back, you want your other players in and around him to exploit those gaps. Into match we go. Now, the first thing to remember is he is still a striker. You can see Lotoro there, pretty much in line with the two most advanced midfielders. But as the game breaks into like a bit of a swift attack down the left-hand side, the guy breaking to get into the box is still the false nine. So he's still your main striker. In defensive situations, he will be the first guy to do the press. The big difference comes in attacking situations. You'll see him drop off and you'll see 
midfielders sprinting past him just like this so Lotoro's hanging around there he's our false nine remember if I pause it there you can see there's a group of players that are more advanced than him because he's showing for the ball to try and get it off Bastoni and tempt the centre backs to follow him see in the middle there he's holding his position he's not trying to break through the lines like an advanced forward or perhaps a poacher or pressing forward would Now he receives it, you can see you've got your players who are about to break past him. Hakan is Segunde Volante over here, you've got attacking midfielder. And obviously you've got your two wide attacking players as well. You'll see a lot of movements like this. So he's in the middle now as your main striker, but you can see how he drops back a bit there? Look at that. He's trying to draw these centre-backs out to allow these midfielders a space to bomb into. You'll see that quite a lot when you're using this role. It means when you have a look at your passing network, such as ours here, he drops deep all the time. As a main focal point striker, he'd be more in this sort of area here, further up. But you can see how deep he is, number 10. His want to drop in here quite often means a gag and press style, a really high tempo style. It's probably not the one to do. This one here is probably not the best use of him because he's going to get bypassed an awful lot. A more possession based style with a lower tempo is perfect. Think of the way Pep played before Haaland was there. Fordham was quite often the man who dropped into the false nine role. This slower, more controlled tempo means that he can do more of the pulse nine movements, such as there, where he's dropping off to come to the ball, allowing these players to go past him. This more controlled style means he can get more involved in the game. Remember, he is a playmaker. He's just a little bit further forward. You can see here he comes, shows for the ball, and goes down the wing, dribbling this time and trying to assist his teammates. So my favourite approach is a tick attacker style where he can drop in and have players burst and past him. Another interesting option is to have a strike partner up with him so when he drops off, hopefully a centre-back leaves him and that'll leave the other strike partner one-on-one. -on -one. When you look at key attributes for a false nine, you're looking for things that don't normally come up for a striker, such as things like passing, flair, vision, because he's going to be dropping off more. It's very similar to if you put him in the AM slot as an advanced playmaker. You can see there, it's very similar attributes. He's basically an advanced playmaker but higher up, dropping back rather than dropping forward. So a very cool role if you have the right player. Just make sure you have the right positions around him to take advantage of the space. The inverted winger. How should we use this role to its maximum potential? The inverted winger cuts inside when he gets the ball, making space for overlapping fullbacks and then overload central areas. With a support duty, he will cut diagonally alongside looking to play through balls. With an attack duty, he's slightly more aggressive and may look to shoot on occasions. The most obvious difference between the inverted winger role and the inside forward role is you can obviously use the inverted winger role from a deeper start point in the midfield. Hopefully that shows you that it's a less aggressive role than the inside forward and it's a little bit more flexible. There are more differences when you press on the inside forward you can see his hard coded player instructions there is more of them and they're more aggressive individual type roles such as dribbling more, cutting inside, crossing less, taking more risks whereas your inverted winger hard coded is just dribble more and cut inside, more movement based rather than what he does on the ball, so he's more of a team player. We'll be using Luis Diaz today to show the inverted winger role in match. So when you're defending, he will get nice and deep and help out the team. You can see here, he's pretty much in line with the other central midfielders. Now, in attacking movements, when he does get the ball, it's important to remember that he's still a winger, albeit inverted, so quite a lot of the time, he won't always cut inside. He will drive down to the byline, but when he gets there, he will cut back like that and look for players in this sort of area there. Whereas a traditional winger would try and hit the byline, he'll look to cut inside or play a through ball in field for his teammates. It's also a key difference between the inverted winger and the inside forward. When Diaz picks the ball up here, if he's an inside forward, he's going to carry on breaking into this sort of area, gunning for the box, dribbling at these defenders. But as he's still a winger, he does still use the width of the pitch. And then instead of hitting the byline, he will look in field. But it's a key difference from the inside forward who would have attacked the box quicker. And that's a good thing to point out because a lot of people get confused between these two roles because they are pretty similar. It's just that the inside forward tends to do more individualistic style things, attacking that box more than the inverted winger would. You'll see this an awful lot when he picks the ball up here, driving down the sidelines, so keeping the width, but always cutting back and looking for that ball inside. And those runs I've just showed you, believe it or not, are not classed as dribbling. If you can see here, 
dribbles in this match up until 50 minutes, you can see the difference between inside forward, who's had six, and Diaz, who's only had one. So they're more progressive movements that he's doing down the sidelines. Your dribbling is when you're taking on men. In this same match, this is Mbappe doing it. This is what you'd call a dribble, where he's taking men on and going for goal, and he is an inside forward. So your inverted winger is more of a team-based player, looking to progress the ball, create chances. Your inside forward, Salah, more individualistic, more attacking. Even when we've got the ball here, you can see Diaz is below the halfway line, Salah is over the halfway line. Now watch Salah when the ball gets to Virgil van Dijk. Now, he's off, he's looking for the ball over the top like a striker would, whereas Luis Diaz is kind of dropping, waiting for the ball there. Salah's on the shoulder, trying to get in behind. So they're both creative roles, but your inverted winger will try and create things from deeper as well, such as here when we've got the ball here. Jones, Diaz is there showing for the ball. If he's an inside forward, he's going to be looking over the top. But he waits for the ball because he's looking to create it. When he sees that now, he's got three, four players he can aim at, and that's what he does. When the ball comes to Jones, if Diaz is an inside forward, he's going to be charging through there, trying to get onto the through ball. But as an inverted winger, he's going to show for the ball and look to create. And if you've got pacey strikers with good off the ball movement and anticipation, it might be a good way to go because when he receives the ball there, he's got three players to aim at. And that's exactly what he does. It's not to say he won't be a threat in inside areas as well. When the opportunity arises, he will take that shot on. Luis Diaz is a great example of the inverted winger role. And interestingly, if you highlight winger, you can see that a lot of the mental aspects are dropped because that's a more a to B kind of role where the inverted winger is more of a hybrid so it's going to ask a little bit more of your player. The inverted winger role, an alternative to your traditional winger role and an alternative to the inside forward. One of the most popular roles in Football Manager and real life, it's inside forward. Your inside forward will start wide and then cut inside from the flanks, running directly at the centre backs or defensive central midfielders the movement will open up space for overlapping fullbacks because he's going to vacate that area when he's got an attack duty or a support duty. He will run at the defence directly with options of shooting or laying on through balls. So what they're saying is he will start out here and as soon as you start to attack, he'll either drift in field if the ball is down the opposite flank or if he does have the ball, he'll cut inside attacking the central areas. This then means when he's in this sort of area here with the ball or without, your wing back can do the overlap and do the work down the flank. It's also important to remember that he is a forward. That's why it says forward in the name. So his primary objective is to affect things in an attacking sense. He will still track back, but not as much as an inverted winger would. Into match we go, and we'll be using what's probably the best example of inside forward in today's football in Mo Salah. So here we see when we first gets the ball there, you'll see his first intention is to move in field. And as he does that, you can see the wing back, Trent, will occupy that space for him. As you saw in that clip, with Trent occupying that space, he's then able to occupy more central areas. When Trent gives him the ball here, he cuts inside and he's able to play the through ball in for Nunes. So when defending, you can see he's still pretty high up. When we win the ball back, he gets into his start position, but sees it's on the other flank, then cuts inside and he's able to act like a second striker now and benefit. So remember what the game's telling you. We've got him on a attack duty. He's going to run directly at that defence with the options of shooting or passing. So back in game, when we win the ball back, you can see him there. He's on the halfway line. He's not exactly breaking a neck to get back in defence because he's still a forward and has those forward instincts. However, when we do win the ball back, that means that he's in a really good position for counter-attacks such as this with Kanate getting the ball. Salah's already in a really advanced position and when the central midfielder and striker combined Salah now turns into that striker again he's in the box now he's got people to aim at and this is where the creativity also helps with the dribbling creating chances and that's key because he's a forward so he doesn't want to go up too far back so you've got to bear that in mind when you're planning your team if you're looking for a team to defend as a big unit inside forward probably not the way to go but if you want a constant attacking threat from wide, it's ideal. So we've established that your inside forward is basically a striker, just really wide. And it really helps with his anticipation and movement when chances are about to come up. Pause it there, Nunes. Now, if Salah's a winger, it's likely it'll go down this channel here. But because he's more of an inside forward, a striker, 
He makes that inside movement there and bags it. If you take a look at the passing network, you'll see a bit of a difference between the inverted winger and inside forward. Number seven is Luis Diaz, inverted winger. A lot deeper, and you can see where Salah is, number 11. He's a lot more advanced and more central. You'll also see your inside forward do a lot more individual stuff, such as dribbling. We'll see more Salah across here. Four dribbles attempted in the 70 or so minutes, and just under him, Luis Diaz with zero. This little graphic here shows what he does when he gets the ball and starts to dribble. You can see every time he comes inside, he never goes outside. So bear that in mind when constructing your tactic, he you wants someone down the flanks, you're going to need a fullback to do that job. Similar story for his key passes. They're all from that inside area, just inside the right, rather than starting down the right-hand side. His hard-coded play instructions basically tell you what he's going to be up to. Dribbling more, cutting inside, taking more risks. Doesn't really cross because he doesn't get into the position to cross, but he'll always get further forward. So Mo Salah there is probably the best example of an inside forward. He's got the full package that you'll need, and it's handy that he's left-footed on the right-hand side as well. The inside forward, basically a really wide creative striker, giving you real attacking threat from those wide areas.